So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning from Tokyo. Uh, this is the Thursday, November 14, 2019, in our seminar series on edge computing, where we're really looking at trends not only in the U.S., but in Asia. And uh, I'm very happy to be here in Tokyo with one of Japan's, uh, a representative of one of Japan's most exciting startups in edge computing. So our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Atsunori Kanemura, who is the chief research officer and also the chief scientific uh, officer of uh, LeapMind. And LeapMind is a uh, post-Series C startup. They just closed their Series C round last month for about $35 million. So uh, congratulations to uh, LeapMind for that. And uh, before uh, I ask uh, Dr. Kanemura to speak, I do want to recognize that we have a couple of visitors with us. First of all, I want to say thanks very much to Kawasaki Heavy Industries for uh, hosting us here at WeWork in Tokyo, where they've got a kind of innovation office cloistered away from their main office, which is an interesting approach. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, also, I'd like to recognize, I'm probably not going to move the camera all the way over to it, but uh, from another one of our member companies at the US Asia uh, Technology Management Center, we have the chairman of Mitsubishi Research Institute, Mr. Kilta Omori with us. And I'm also happy to say that we have Mr. Taichi um, Soga from uh, Japan's National Broadcaster, NHK Corporation, with us today. So we've got a, a group here, but this is going to be an interactive conference. Now, because it's kind of, you know, being recorded on the TV and we're, uh, I'm going to start uh, sharing slides once uh, kanemura san begins his presentation. Uh, yeah, we'd like to reserve most of the questions until after he's through with his prepared remarks. But uh, I'm going to uh, move this over here so that, are you seeing us on the big screen or are you seeing that, uh, just the blank page with Mia Zoya sign? Okay, you are, great. So we'll, uh, this is Dr. Kanemura and why don't you start off and I will get your slides up while you're talking. Oh, Is that okay? Or okay, yeah. You want to do it yourself? Okay, I'll do that. And uh, this one? The, that's the one. Okay. Great. And you take full screen if you wish. While Dr. Kanemura is doing this, I'd like to point out that his PhD is in informatics from Kyoto University. Uh, besides his roles at LeapMind, he's an invited senior scientist at two of uh, Japan's national research institutions, the AIST, uh, Advanced Institute for uh, Science and Tech, Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Scuba, Japan, and also Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute, also known as ATR Labs in Kyoto. He's the author of over 50 papers, including best paper awards, not only from the Japan Neural Network Society, but also from the IEEE Trustcom. So we're really delighted that you can uh, talk to us today and uh, tell us more about LeapMind. Yeah, thanks, Professor Dasha, for a nice introduction. And also, uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this lecture, today. and I would like to also thank the people from uh, course. Okay. And uh, okay, the title of my presentation is uh, "Remind Direction for Edge Computing uh, Ultra Low Computation on Embedded Devices," and uh, yeah, dated November fifteenth. But on your side, it's still fourteenth. Uh, okay, let me uh, briefly introduce our company, Leap. Mind, not deep mind, <laughs> and uh, it was established about seven years ago. But actually, uh, we started heavily focused on so called edge computing or edge AI about just three years ago, and now we have uh, 85 people. And uh, the fund we have raised so far in total is uh, 60 sorry, uh, 46 million 
including the the the, the, the last year's fundraising. And our investors includes Intel Capital, Toyota, and others. And uh, our corporate mission is to create in innovative devices with machine learning and make them available everywhere. And uh, ma the management includes those people, and uh, I'm here. And uh, LeapMind has been uh, <clears throat> featured in like, several, or I would say many, uh, magazines and articles includes Forbes Japan, Bloomberg, in, in, and uh, this is a brief introduction about our company. But uh, I'd like to emphasize that what is important is that our company, LeapMind, exists to achieve this mission uh, to create innovative devices with, with machine learning and make them everywhere. And I would like to explain what uh, I mean by, for example, innovative devices, and also what do I mean by saying making them available everywhere? Okay, and the uh, growth of multi devices and need for intelligent data processing. And that uh, this is trend and the forecast of the number of IoT devices estimated by uh, Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. And, uh, you know, IoT devices now include uh, many things like smartphones and uh, some home appliances are already connected to the internet. And the more uh, devices like uh, measuring your uh, electricity on your home will be replaced with those IoT devices. And it is expected that in the next year, the number of those devices will reach to 40, uh, 40 billion. And let me just skim over the slides, or oh, I already explained for a few seconds for each. And uh, yeah, this is a establishment. You're looking at the slide that shows when the company was established? Okay, great. Good. And the next slide is having our company's mission with a fancy background picture. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, the photos of um, the management people and uh, some magazines. Okay. Good. And uh, this is the growth of the number of the IoT devices which uh, will reach to uh, 40 billion in the next year. And also after uh, the next year, it is expected that the number of those devices will increase more and the market size will reach to a, to a huge amount. And the data generated annually will be 44 zeta bytes, which is the next unit of exa. And I think it's uh, 10 to the 21st, which I cannot imagine. And uh, uh, and by distrib distributing uh, those IoT devices, what we would like to do, and some applications include intelligent uh, processing of the data collected by those IoT devices. And uh, now AI has been empowered by GPU and also cloud computing. But for some applications, uh, those two key technology to date uh, are not available. For example, for GPU, it uh, can be too costly to deploy massively on every IoT device. And also, uh, even with uh, mobile GPU like NVIDIA's Jetson Nano, its power consumption is about 10 watts, which is very small compared to a standard GPU, which consumes 200 watts. However, it's, it's still uh, too much to be deployed for IoT devices. And for the use of cloud, you need uh, internet connection. And uh, however, for those IoT devices, uh, data trans transmission of a network is not always up. Then, and uh, this is shows our uh, market segments and uh, for some uh, domains uh, can you see the hello or high? can you see the cursor moving yeah okay 
uh, I think it's a uh, so, uh, small no, she's Yeah, she yeah. said yes. Good. And uh, for some applications like media, entertainment, uh, you, of course, have a continue, constant connection to the internet to transfer the massive amount of data for conveying like movies, uh, music. However, for other applications like some uh, factory automations and uh, for security purposes where even if you have internet connection, you don't want to transmit your data. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, this domain is like low power and the edge cases. And uh, we see a big market and uh, needs in here and also, we still need to have more technology development. <clears throat> and uh, let me share an interesting study published yesterday, uh, no, today, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> at, at your clock, and uh, which has been published at the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is from Apple uh, Heart Study Investigators, and uh, it has been issued that uh, Arterial fibrillation, which is like vibration of your heart, is very bad for your health, of course. However, if we can detect uh, arterial uh, fibrillation early, even before you notice it, then we can prevent uh, further cardiovascular diseases like having strokes. And a natural idea is that to use a wearable and also non-invasive non -non -invasive, uh, measurement with a smartwatch or other wearable device to continuously monitor your heart pulse. And they did it. Uh, they collect pulse data from about uh, all <clears throat> at the, this number of people. And, and the result was remarkable. So 84% of the people who got the regular pulse uh, notification from the system that uh, Apple Heart Study Investigator has developed. They, actually had arterial fabrication based on ECG uh, data. So, and also, also uh, many of them were not aware of their disease. So if, and this is just an, one of the early example of using IoT devices and uh, use uh, intelligent processing uh, there, and uh, unfortunately, this study, I think, is not a real-time application and the post-processing data. But uh, I imagine such application with widespread over the world. And uh, LeapMind would like to develop key technologies to achieve this. Okay. And uh, our direction is to use compact neural networks and also uh, design their hardware accelerators. And uh, I would like to skip like, mostly what is deep learning and uh, what is revolutionizing about uh, deep learning because you, all of you, I assume, already knew this. But uh, this is a typical architecture of a neural networks uh, for image recognition. And we would like to run these uh, neural networks models on edge devices. But the issue uh, we needed to resolve is that we needed to have like small size and low power consumption network. And uh, we need to achieve real-time response uh, because, so here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so, sorry, uh, about 10 layers of the network architecture. However, the deeper networks includes like uh, more than 100 layers and it, it, it could uh, require many time to uh, give response. And also, uh, we don't want to use network connection to do that. So we need a technology that run and uh, limited power resources and uh, output very fast response and uh, should be available even without network connection. Okay. And the and to achieve that goal, we have three key uh, technologies. And uh, the first one is low bit and the quantized uh, neural networks, which is to like minimize the amount of memory and inference you need to store and also run uh, neural networks. And the second thing is uh, hardware uh, designed 
hardware accelerators that they are designed to most efficiently process those quantized uh, neural networks. And the third one is a software stack developed dedicated for running those uh, quantized neural networks on hardware accelerator. And uh, before going into some more detail about those uh, technologies, let me uh, give you examples of the project we did in the past. And uh, I think we have uh, done joint project with several hundreds of companies. And uh, those projects include like, driving support and uh, defection screening, drone control support, uh, crack detection, uh, danger alert from surveillance camera, and also uh, contamination inspection for food or other materials. And uh, let me uh, give you four specific projects as uh, some more concrete examples. And the first one is with Kawasaki Heavy Industries. And uh, uh, this is the train site. And uh, sometimes small object like an umbrella is caught in the train door. In that case, uh, the train should not start because it's dangerous. And of course, the current door system has a sensor to detect if the door is closed or not. However, those, uh, for those thin or small object, that sensor uh, cannot detect the door has uh, something called, door catches something. Therefore, uh, we did a project to detect those small objects caught in the train. By the way, this train is a Tsukuba Exp Exp Express line, and I live in Tsukuba. So today, I took this train, and fortunately enough, I didn't uh, get any of my objects caught in the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, real-time response is very important because, you know, uh, Japanese people are very punctual, Except for the timing they finish work, but, but <laughs> and uh, after the doors are closed, uh, it's only two seconds before the train departure. So we need to do like real time processing and uh, transmitting a large amount of data. And that uh, in cloud computing is not a uh, right solution here. And uh, that's why uh, we developed uh, data processing and the deep learning with edge devices. And the target device we uh, choose was uh, Transic D10 Nano that is equipped with Intel Cyclone 5 SOC. And uh, sorry for jargons, but uh, this is a uh, like palm sized device, and the power consumption is about several watt. And uh, so this chip in the middle is uh, FPGA, so called, uh, which we call uh, hardware, and our hardware accelerator is in this chip. And uh, now, is that the Intel Cyclone chip? Yes. Okay. And this is SOC, and also inside it uh, is ARM uh, A9 CPU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the accuracy of the model we have developed and we run on that uh, small device. And uh, if nothing is caught in the door, then it it's, uh, successfully emit a green light. And if fingers or the umbrella and the trotro is <laughs> yeah, here, then uh, it automatically detects something here. And also the time, the speed of uh, finishing those detection is for, uh, not, uh, it was 1.24 seconds. And I think this was several uh, generation of the technology. And uh, I think our technology now can achieve more like faster processing. Now, when you're calculating that 1.24 seconds, mm -hmm. a train will have 12 or 16 cars and two or three doors on a car. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about 25 or 26 doors all closing at the same time. Uh, yes. Or you can, so really, all of that's being processed somewhere. Yes, 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 and distributed. Okay. And, and, and this device uh, is expected to be attached to the door with more smaller and also 
nicely in uh, uh, how do you call it in caged yeah, yeah yeah but the alert would be sent through the system to the train operator yeah only the alert signal is yeah. submitted and right. uh, this is the record of the signals are uh, transmitted over the train, mm -hmm. which has already uh, here door close open uh, signals, and uh, it's kind of having another line of signals which has a um, small object a lot. Okay, let me shift to the next project, which which is with JAXA. JAXA is a Japanese counterpart of NASA, and the JAXA is responsible for space uh, exploration uh, from Japan. And the uh, and, uh, spacecrafts are, of course, in the space. And this is uh, one of the extreme edge cases. And uh, you cannot uh, transmit a large amount of data. And even if you have bandwidth, then the, we have a large latency and the power resources are very limited because it can only capture like uh, solar energy or other battery and uh, we cannot take GPU or cloud approaches and uh, and uh, as, as the first task uh, the people in JAXA considered space aircraft selfie project because you know, the practical project should include a kind of automatic navigation based on imaginary sensors to to, to, to automatically uh, track some uh, object or automatically landing to the moon or the satellite to a space point. However, at the first project, we choose this project. And uh, so... Now, is that the Hayabusa 2? that is going to the asteroid and is just turned around to come back? Yeah, but, but this or is, is this kind of imaginary. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So. And actually we had a, what do you call it, real cassette model, or mm -hmm. I think this is balloon, and this is a model yeah. of a satellite. But what, uh, and what uh, we wanted to do is to detect which image is the best one, I mean, yeah. here only the asteroid, the tip of this asteroid is here, not good. And the here only uh, the spacecraft is here. But in the middle, and the both asteroid and the spacecraft are nicely in the in a single image. So this is the best image. So we would like to submit only this image because the bandwidth is, bandwidth is not enough to send all of them. And uh, so this is actual result, and uh, what is uh, shown here is the score. And for not nice images, scores are very low. However, for nice for these nice images, score is very high. And uh, and now, yeah, and uh, we we did like spacecraft survey project with them. And the next project is with entity data. And uh, if you look at the image on the left, you will see many electric wires. And uh, I think in in Silicon Valley, you don't see them. However, in Japan, there are many electric wires on the skies. And uh, we have many typhoons, and we needed to uh, constantly inspect any malfunctions on the wire. And also, I don't square or my monkey may do something bad. And uh, they considered to use a drone to automatically track uh, wires. However, uh, you can imagine detecting a wire, very thin, thin object uh, from a drone is uh, not easy. And also the power resource is very limited because a large amount of battery is used for like a motor, not, uh, and they do not want to use it for uh, deep learning. So we collaborated and uh, achieved uh, having a very lightweight and compact neural network for detecting wires on the skies. And the uh, fourth and the last project is with Riken. Riken is Japanese one of the largest uh, scientific research uh, institute under the Ministry of Education and Science. And uh, uh, we applied a uh, machine learning technique to physics. Actually, I have collaborated with an experimental physicist at uh, Riken, and uh, 
I don't uh, explain the detail of this project, but what is important is that this uh, dotted line is the theoretically best uh, trajectory. This is the theoretically best. And uh, everybody worked in that physical sphere and believe it. However, by using machine learning approaches, we have discovered that uh, those colored trajectory that are very far from the theoretical best trajectory, actually they achieve better result than theoretical best. And one of the reviewers uh, said that uh, it may be uh, discovering new physics beyond the conventional approach. And uh, however, so this, uh, our paper just reported this phenomena and uh, we don't know why yet. And uh, this is, I think, the end of explaining the project. And uh, let me explain more about Libram technology. And the uh, air quantization to low bit. And uh, I think uh, many of you already know that computers represent numbers using bits. And uh, typically, we use several tens of bits to represent one number. And uh, if we use uh, 32 bit, it's, uh, it's something we call uh, floating. And we can use 30 bits to represent number in floating, so-called floating point numbers. And uh, this is a single, so-called single precision and the half precision. And we can, and uh, as we reduce the number of bits to represent numbers in computers or numbers in uh, your network. Of course, we lose precision, we lose accuracy. The data representation is not uh, faithful, not uh, not like good. However, we imagined if we use only one bit, which essentially says the number is either uh, one or zero, only two choices, then we can achieve a great reduction of model size and rapid computation. And it is not uh, hard to imagine the size will be reduced a lot. However, so why uh, the computation is accelerated is that, so if we would like to do, for example, multiplication, we, if you would like to get the product of two floating point numbers, you need a dedicated circuit for that uh, task. However, if uh, you use only one bit, it, it's, if I exaggerate, it, it's just kind of counting the number of ones, very simple and we do not need to uh, consume a large number of circuit footprint. This is the basic idea, and uh, we did it. And uh, actually, we used one bit for neural network weights and the two bit for neural network activations. And uh, by doing so, it has only zero or one kind of block and white. And activation has only uh, four selections and the original uh, image is uh, simplified a lot. And uh, we discovered that even with uh, this extreme uh, low bit representation, we can achieve something great. Uh, for the size of the model, so uh, this is the comparison of the size of models. For MobileNet V2, uh, released by Google, its size is 8.5 megabytes, which is already great because the excellent people at Google uh, endeavored to have a neural network run on mobile devices. And uh, however, by quantizing uh, to more just one and two bit, and also by modifying the network architecture, we achieved 99% reduction in the model size. And uh, the accuracy is expected to decrease. However, uh, we developed, developed several techniques to prevent such accuracy drop. And uh, I think uh, we, I would say and the accuracy degradation is very minimal compared to, compared to before quantization. And uh, we are designing a hardware dedicated for running a quantized neural network. So of course, uh, you cannot run general network with our uh, circuit design. It is dedicated only for quantized network. 
But uh, thanks to the very simple design of the neural network, our hardware is very uh, like small and uh, and and uh, kind of here. Uh, uh, we still have CPU, but the CPU load is lowered greatly thanks to the accelerator, accelerator because we can uh, use the accelerator for most of the heavy computations for neural networks. And uh, we can reduce the size of memory on the board and the chip. And uh, also here is a reduced circuit footprint accelerator with bit operations. This is what I have explained about two or three slides before and the thanks to the low bit representations, uh, we do not need to have a floating point operation circuit and uh, multiplication addition. Those are very simplified and uh, hardware logic is very simple so that we can achieve very small footprint and also low power consumption. Then we can still use uh, mature contrast manufacturing processes uh, thicker than the modern manufacturing process and still achieve good performance. And uh, unfortunately, this product is not available yet, but we have already released a software stack behind our technology uh, under the name of Blue Oil. And this actually is an open source software and uh, you can access, uh, you can get the source code from this uh, GitHub site, github.com Blue hyphen oil, blue oil. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, get uh, the name without hyphen, but <laughs> you can access here to get software. And actually, uh, if you have a FPGA board, you can uh, run a quantized neural network on your side. And uh, this is uh, what's inside the or but I think I would try to skip most of them. Yeah, <laughs> too, too complicated. <laughs> and uh, also we are designing a processor IP core, uh, which is hardware design for low power consumption accelerator. And I think that concludes my presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, great. While uh, we switch over from the slides, I got a couple of questions that I want to ask. First of all, you may not know, but you're at the seventh week in our series on edge computing. And in previous weeks, we've uh, had presentations by uh, people that I think you may know, uh, such as uh, Intel. Mm -hmm. We had them talk about their chip acceleration. We also so uh, we also had a presentation a couple of weeks ago by Tiny ML. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, LeapMind involved with Intel or with Tiny ML? I don't think so. Okay. So is is what you're doing kind of a competitor to the Tiny ML? <laughs> I think uh, I think because. A tiny ML or other lightweight uh, libraries, I think they do not afford one bit. I think they do not employ one bit operation. Okay, okay, so, but, but the, the point is the same. Uh, but now, no. what you have is a full software stack, though, mm -hmm. and my understanding is they're really looking at kind of the interface between CPU and mm -hmm. uh, the outside the kind of sensor. They're really looking at sensor networks more than anything else. Uh, but uh, I, you're not cooperating with them or and, and, and your idea not necessarily competing with them. Yeah, right? yeah I, answered, okay. I, I answered no because I think the power consumption of circuit footprint is I think uh, sh should be order of magnitude different. Okay. I think ours are more like small. Even smaller. Yeah. And okay. I think the domain uh, is very much different. Okay. And uh, although I said the the performance of the network after quantization stays all the same, that yeah. is that is just one example. And the weak point about our technology is that we cannot uh, quantize any network. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, for image classification, like uh, object detection, instance segmentation, for yeah. for several tasks, we have succeeded in having very lightweight and also high performing networks. Okay. However, it doesn't mean we can quantize any 
uh, deep learning models. Okay. So if you want to use very complicated neural, neural network model that is not easy to quantize, then you should uh, you can think of using solutions uh, supplied from other uh, companies. Okay. But but but, but still, uh, we are expanding the model. We can quantize. Sure. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think uh, oh, LeapMind does not cover all of them yet. Okay. So about your business model, Blue Oil is open source. Yes. Now, if it's available on GitHub, I guess it's available for free. Yes. And okay. it, it's licensed under Apache 2.0, okay. and which guarantees you that you can use it freely, even for commercial purposes. Right. And so that means that LeapMind is earning revenue through joint development projects, joint research, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and these projects like the four that you had mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So um, do you see that as the kind of preferred way to continue to grow the business? Yeah, these yeah, yeah, yeah. projects. I have to say, it sounds a lot like preferred networks, mm -hmm. kind of a generation before LeapMind, which was doing something similar with um, industrial robotics, mm -hmm. uh, bringing artificial intelligence into industrial robotics. Um, do you see uh, LeapMind expanding into Silicon Valley? <laughs> so difficult question, but of course, Our preferred networks has. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but of course we plan to yeah. extend our business worldwide, and okay. uh, we would like to have branches all over the world. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, we would like to take necessary actions to like expand our technique okay. to worldwide. So, in light of that, mm -hmm. really one of the questions that we're asking everybody in this in our series of seminars is whether you really see edge computing developing in sort of different directions in Asia than it is in the U.S. I mean, for one thing, the train door application is an absolutely great application <laughs> for Japan. Yeah. So on the applications, you've got some things that are really obviously mm -hmm. appropriate for some markets more than for others, right? Mm -hmm. But how, what about the way that people are solving these problems of lowering power and increasing speed, you know, accelerating the, the systems. So I don't see a large wall uh, separating Asia and the other parts of uh, the world. And the uh, core technologies are very like the same. Uh -huh. And uh, then what should I add? For example, some people in Japan say say that oh, Japan has a uniqueness in its, for example, factory automation. Yeah. And we should have uh, all Japan uh, structure to develop or strengthen this already st strong part more. Yeah. However, I don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, we don't need to only unite with Japanese companies, Japanese people, and we can cooperate with others and extend our technology. I think you'll find a lot of people with global points of view in Silicon Valley. Too. <laughs> so thank you. Why don't we open the floor to questions? And I want to say thanks to Kimberly Williams, who is our interim acting uh, assistant director at the uh, U.S. Asia okay. Technology Management Center for kind of being our point person at Stanford. Kimberly, um, yes. would you call on someone for a question? Certainly. Questions. Great, right down here in front. <coughs> what's the power level you're targeting? Questions, what's so the, the power what's level? What's the power level you're targeting? <coughs> the power level. So, the below one watt, uh, milliwatt scale. Okay. Okay. Next question. I think we have a shot. Oh, oh yeah. here we go. Okay. So. Yep, right over here. So. How is 5G doing in Japan? In the United States, we have run into trouble because we can't get spectrum. Did you hear that? So what I heard was 5G, but Kimberly, can you give me a little more from that? Say that one more time. Yes. Uh, how is Japan doing in 5G for the edge? In the United States, we're running into trouble because we're having a hard time getting spectrum. 
So the current proposal is actually to connect the radios directly to the cloud. Mm, sorry, I didn't get the... Okay, so this may not be right for your expertise, but the question is about how is 5G in Japan. Mm -hmm. In the United States, the problem is that there's not spectrum available for the radio access in mm -hmm. 5G. And so there is some suggestion to connect the IoT devices somehow directly to the cloud, but yeah. you've got to have radio access somehow. Yeah, but... If well, I to get yeah, 5G radios directly to the cloud, to connect the 5G radios directly to the cloud. I see. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of a, I, I don't know, that's sort of a different uh, technical area that we're dealing with this week. Uh, I'm not sure. Have you been looking at 5G in Japan? What does 5G mean for Leap Mind? Yeah. So, so, I think, so we have not uh, taken this uh, so much seriously because we target for edge devices which does not require uh, internet or network connection. However, for example, there are some uh, very uh, low low frequency network connection, a very low power consumption. Uh, what do you call it? LPNG, uh, I forgot. However, I think uh, it is a good combination with, I think not 5G, but other more low frequency and low power uh, uh, mobile connection network. Uh, I think it's a combination with edge devices is very uh, good. Uh, thing. Yeah, so today's session is really all about the processing at the edge itself, in the edge yeah. device itself. Um, and you see your sweet spot really in these kind of relatively extreme cases where you're not even dealing with a gateway server or network. You're really looking at individual devices that might be in an IoT system. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's do another question, please. Uh, did you, yeah. um, so I'm just curious if you have um, any American companies you're currently working with or anything you're looking to, uh, any ideas you have for applications of LeapMind in the US? Mm, I think we have talked with several American companies, but uh, do we have any joint project with the US company? Maybe not yet. And uh, I, and also, however, uh, we would like to, to collaborate more with companies in America because I think uh, our very low power consumption technology should be of interest of many people, uh, many companies there. And also the market uh, governed by US is very, very big. And also not only business opportunity, but also uh, like doing some advanced thing uh, can be easier in the United States. Because, uh, for example, in Japan, it is prohibit prohibited to uh, fly a drone uh, in, in many of the urban areas. But I think uh, in, a, in the United States, I, such kind of like, new attempts can be generously welcome. Okay. Does that okay? Um, let's see. Yeah. How much of your business is in the low power embedded space, augmenting existing sensors versus installing new systems with new sensors? So, can you retrofit to an existing sensor system, mm -hmm. or are you really involved at the stage of developing new sensors only? No, I, or new IoT devices only. Yeah, I think our uh, technology can be combined with, like, even with conventional devices, but uh, they need to be upgraded to include our, for example, if our IP core, which is the design of the chip, can be used for conventional uh, hardware. However, if you would like to use it, you need to modify your design 
and to, to include our IP core hardware design. So what you showed with the train door, you showed a, a picture of the system board mm -hmm. that had the Intel, C, oh. the Intel uh, FPGA in it. And so I'm guessing what you would have to do would be to replace the system board with a system board that had your software in it. Yeah, only that software. And also, but you don't have to replace the sensor itself. All you have to do is replace no. the board. Yeah, and also uh, that the board is just one of the early examples. Yeah. And uh, if you use a FPGA board, then uh, your choice is even more. Uh, I, uh, so there are two major FPGA manufacturers, Intel, formerly out there, and, and, and the Xilinx. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have like a hardware design for Xilinx, and uh, you can choose. So, and, uh, and that can be combined with any sensors. In that regard, if I can follow through, I see a real resurgence in the chip industry of a lot of development activity to really move away from FPGAs mm -hmm. and toward ASICs mm -hmm. for specific applications mm -hmm. because you can save power, you can yes. speed up the system just by having the loss of flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, would your 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 approach would still improve speed and power consumption, even if it's an ASIC, right? If you're yes, putting yes, your software yes. into an ASIC too. Yeah, the, 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 the basic design principle of the hardware is the same for yeah. FPGA and the ASIC, and the volume matters if you would like to choose ASIC because the initial production cost is very high for ASIC. Yeah. So if you would like to use many then you should choose ASIC. And if your volume is full enough, then you can use FPGA. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. So in your mission statement, you mentioned you want to make the machine learning, you know, make them available everywhere. And yes. you give some examples. Do you want uh, and do you have specific areas or sectors that you are particular interested in developing partnership like healthcare or smart home or you know, those B2B, B2C? Mm -hmm. So the company mission, uh, we decided it to be very long-term goal. So it doesn't include any specific domains. However, I think uh, we currently collaborating with uh, companies uh, from like heavy industries, factory automation, automotives. And uh, I think uh, not with the healthcare companies yet. And uh, as a researcher, I am very much interested in expanding the, the, the boundary of science. And that's why I collaborate with the experimental physicists. Uh, they are very much interested in so-called AI technology, and that they believe if they use such modern technology, they can uh, discover more like scientific outcomes, and I believe so too. And I would like to cooperate with them from the AI side. Thank you. So let me follow up kind of not so much with which industries are of interest, but in terms of which AI uh, particular approaches there are. So there's deep learning and deep reinforcement learning and, and whatever convoluted neural networks and so forth. Uh, how does that impact what you're doing? Are you working primarily with deep learning, yeah. deep learning now? Yeah. And uh, do you see other types of approaches to AI becoming interesting enough to work with them as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. And uh, our company mission says machine learning, not deep learning. Okay. Because uh, we want to include other machine learning techniques. And uh, although the current focus of the company is to have compact learning, compact deep learning models, however, I believe so. If I speak with companies, then I often suggest or consider uh, to solve your issue. I think uh, this technique, not deep learning, should be fastly considered and it should suit better than using deep learning uh -huh. and it really depends on the nature of the problem or 
or the, the amount of data they have, or the level of introducing AI technology. And uh, I think uh, you should start from using a more basic machine learning technology, or start from uh, constructing constructing a data collection platform before yeah. uh, using deep learning. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd kind of like to pivot off of that mm -hmm. question and ask you to tell us a little bit about artificial intelligence sort of research and approaches in Japan in general. Because <laughs> these days, all we hear about in Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley in China. Okay. Right, so I think to see that you, you know, got your degree in informatics at uh -huh. Keldai, and you've worked with national research institutes here and so forth. What's going on with AI in Japan? Okay, I would say there are three main uh, streams in Japan's AI research community. The first one is kind of a theoretical approach, strong mach machine learning approach. Uh, which is led by Professor Masashi Sugiyama from uh, University of Tokyo. And also he is the director of RIKEN, uh, AIP Advanced Intelligence Project Center. And uh, he strongly believed that theoretical and mathematical approach should be the one uh, you should take. And uh, he strongly promotes uh, that direction. And actually very successful, uh, his center publishes many papers at top conference like ICM and New Rips and a very strong, I think, presence uh, over the world compared to other two uh, mm -hmm. streams. And then the second stream is kind of uh, like, uh, you know, Professor Hiroshi Ishiguro? Ishiguro. Who, yeah, yeah, from Osaka University who, yeah. who developed a Geminoid, right. which is like, looks like a human robot. Right. However, I would say the robotics technology behind his Gemini robot is not very advanced because uh, their primary interest is kind of cognitive approach. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I remember Professor Sugiyama criticized them, <laughs> <laughs> by the way. And uh, they got uh, great funding so far before uh, Professor Sugiyama. And, yeah. uh, and uh, their presence in Japan is very big. However, I think the global presence is not uh, so much. Although big, his robots have been yes, featured yes, yes, quite yes. a bit. However, yeah. uh, do you know any like uh, technologies or advanced oh, behind no. it? I think <laughs> no. that is very similar. Yeah, because yeah. that is because their interest is cognitive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the third stream is actually, I I was originally from the third stream, which is uh, computational neuroscience. And actually ATR, uh, we, for which I work as a, a visiting scientist, mm -hmm. is uh, the center of computational neuroscience in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, would like to rebuild the brain or the human being by using computational approach, including machine learning. And uh, their original goal is very practical. If you can develop uh, something that behaves the same as human, then you are done, you succeeded. And however, uh, unfortunately, the neuroscience knowledge for pursuing this approach is not enough. And uh, they are successful in developing, for example, robots that do ping pong, or other applications, but uh, still far from rebuilding the human from a computational approach. So, okay. yeah. And uh, what is core, or what is what brings this boom of AI is the first approach headed by Professor Jeffrey Hinton. And the first approach headed by Professor Hinton yes, 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 yes. is closest to that that uh, Sugiyama. Professor Sugiyama yes, yes, yes. is using, right? Okay. Thanks. It's very unusual to get a very clear and concise overview like that. Uh, let's have another uh, question from the audience. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I want yes. a clarification. If you use only one and two bit weights, does it increase the depth of the network? Depth? Uh, you mean the number of layers? Yeah. It, so, 
So sometimes you need to, uh, sometimes if you, sometimes you need to increase the number of layers to achieve a better performance. But it's, it's kind of black magic, there is no general rule. What you can do is to try and uh, get error and uh, sometimes you succeed. And uh, so then, yeah, yes, my, my answer is, uh, yes, you need to adjust the depth of the network to have uh, the best performance, <coughs> even with uh, congelation. But that still yields, even increasing the number of layers in the neural net, uh, still yields speeding up if you can use just yes, the, yes, yes, the, yes. the one bit yeah, number yeah, because and no floating point. Yeah, yeah, because operation for each layer is is reduced a lot. So yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question or so. We actually have two. Okay. Right. So. You mentioned that was a very nice summary of what's happening in, in, in academics for AI in Japan. What are the big companies like Sony and Fujitsu doing? Hmm, <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> Actually, let me point out that uh, Japan's, uh, I think, one unicorn company is this company I mentioned earlier called Preferred Networks that has a greater than $1 billion valuation and they are an AI company. And they're doing uh, large projects with the big Japanese, uh, a lot of them robotics manufacturers, a lot of them transportation uh, related uh, kind of uh, big data question problem solving. Um, and so uh, they actually have a Silicon Valley subsidiary already. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm aware of that. What else would you say is exciting here on the, in the commercial side? Mm, for example, so Sony has uh, released uh, new uh, and, and, so NCC, which is a GUI platform where you can uh, build easily your own network. And I think uh, that is very useful. And the, but in addition to those uh, effort, I think Japanese companies uh, invest to use uh, deep learning and uh, not only deep learning, machine learning techniques a lot in their business and also their customers. And uh, I think NEC is one of the exceptions because they uh, created a dot dot data, which is established in Silicon Valley, headed by uh, Dr. Fujimaki. And uh, uh, Fujimaki-san was an employee of NEC, but he was allowed from NEC to establish a spin-off company using the technologies they, uh, he has developed at NEC. And uh, I think this is very unique uh, thing not seen in other companies. Just so uh, to bring everybody into context, we featured that project in our spring series this year. Okay. Because it is really unusual. And yeah. NECX in Silicon Valley is down in the plug and play center. They're trying to find entrepreneurs and residents to work with some of their researchers that they would like to spin out. Uh, so I think you're right. The big companies are doing things, but they pretty much keep things relatively quiet yeah. most of the time. Uh, I'm aware of Fujitsu. Fujitsu Laboratories of America has a very large uh, AI uh, focus. Uh, and they often have an advanced technology forum that is uh, held in various places in North America every year. Um, there are a number of artificial intelligence related startup companies that are interesting. We just featured Cinnamon uh, which is um, doing kind of uh, IP portfolio analysis, looking at people's intellectual property and using machine learning to see what's really strategic for a company or an investor. Uh, also, ValueNext, which is doing kind of a similar thing. Now, they're already public in Japan. So AI is actually moving along quite well here. Uh, edge computing impresses me as the next big thing. That's why we're focusing the series on it this fall. 
Uh, and uh, it's great to see that things are moving ahead in Japan, especially because I think uh, edge computing combines a lot of areas in which Japan has separate strengths. There is the artificial intelligence community, there's the IoT device developers. A lot of uh, the big companies here are developing really interesting IoT systems. Uh, and you have uh, a lot of experience in putting together complex systems. So that, that has been something I see as a strength in Japan. Uh, of course, it's a very international kind of uh, competitive environment now. And I think that at this point in the series, what I'm seeing is that the edge computing community has not really um, divided into different regional blocks. And I think that's I think that's probably a positive state, and I hope it kind of continues to be internationally active. Uh, would you have any comments you'd like to say about that? So, mm -hmm. yeah, as uh, Professor Professor Dasher said, so Japanese companies does not disclose many uh, much information. However, for example, the technology developed uh, by preferred networks, I think some of it has already been implemented to uh, factory automation machines. Uh, released from FANAC, one of preferred networks investors, and uh, also other companies also already implement uh, some so-called AI technology to their project, I believe, and also investing uh, still more to 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 to, to deploy uh, AI technique to their their products. And uh, yeah, I think that. Come to think of it, it's important to remind everybody that your first project, the train door project, was joint with Kawasaki Heavy <laughs> yeah. Industries. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I really want to thank Kawasaki for making the connection to you. Um, I've been reading about Leap Mind and, and to find that one of our uh, research sponsors has already done business with you is great. <laughs> um, so, Anything from Kawasaki? Any, no comments? Okay. Okay. Uh, Kimberly, is there anything else on your side? Yeah, we have one more question, looks like. Okay. Just a quick question. What are the um, chip companies that specialize right now in um, edge device um, semiconductors? Could you say that again, please? What are the, on the international scale, what are the um, chip making companies that specialize in supporting edge devices? So the chip making companies, the, the, the <coughs> semiconductor companies that are really focusing on edge devices, who, who, are, who are the players? Yeah, there are many. For example, uh, Google, uh, they first released TPU, uh, Tensor Processing Unit, uh, which is uh, designed to be used in data centers, but later they released mobile uh, TPU for mobile use. And uh, so Google is not a semiconductor company, but they employ many hardware engineers and design, and also uh, uh, release their own semiconductor products uh, dedicated for mobile applications. <clears throat> and uh, so speaking of FPGA, for example, uh, there was a Chinese company called D5, which has already been acquired by Xilinx. And uh, they, their technique include uh, running neural networks on FPGA devices. And uh, so, and uh, I would say, if you imagine any a large, a la large tech company, then uh, about 90% of probability they already invest to uh, design or produce a semiconductor for deep learning or AI. And also, especially for light AI on edge devices, yeah. who's, who's really active there? You mentioned Google with developing the mobile yeah, yeah, yeah. TensorFlow chip. And certainly Intel, the company that yeah, we course. featured uh, earlier in our series, they had bought Movidius, which had an acceleration yeah. that was kind of yeah. on the edge. Um, the NVIDIA. Yeah, yeah. So the chip world is kind of 
gradually dividing into the big data center chips. And even inside the data centers, you get some special processing chips that are, are faster because they're, uh, and, you know, they're, they're smaller and, and less flexible in terms of the kinds of things that they can do. Um, and then the chips for the edge devices. And I'm really seeing growth in the edge device side of this. Um, which really makes me think that edge computing is turning into sort of a new architecture beyond cloud computing. Uh, it used to be you had mainframe computers with dumb terminals, and now you've got, uh, and that went to client and server, and it started out with uh, the cloud and relatively simple edge devices, and now the devices are becoming more and more intelligent. So I think uh, this is about a good point for us to close off today. Sorry, We've sorry. got refreshments for people who are in. Dr. Uh, Dasher? Yes. So there is a follow-up. I'm sorry. She has a follow-up. Please do. Go ahead. I, do, I, I couldn't see. I'm so sorry. As a Japanese company, do you rely more on um, Japanese IC providers, or semiconductor providers, providers for Edge, or are you sourcing outside of Japan too? I couldn't quite hear you. We couldn't quite hear you. Um, as a Japanese company, do you rely primarily on Japanese semiconductors um, for your edge devices, or are you sourcing more um, overseas? So are most of the chips that you're putting your software into Japanese uh, semiconductor companies' items, or are you looking at, are you using anybody's chips? So we do uh, collaborate with Japanese like semiconductor designing uh, companies. Uh, however, uh, we of course don't restrict our activity in that domestically in Japan, and we have already uh, talked with the companies overseas uh, for like uh, AI semiconductors and how to produce it, how to implement it. Not not only in Japan. So, is that the right question? Uh, right answer to yeah. your question? Yeah. <coughs> she says she says that helps. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, and and thanks everybody for coming. It's a different experience when we're on TV instead of in the room, but uh, it is kind of nice to see that we can be real time and interactive from across the Pacific, and bring you you know information about what's really happening. You, you had this article that has today's date on it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's great. We're really delighted that we can be with all of you and from everybody here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, enjoy the refreshments outside, and I'll see you in person again next week when we have a discussion of augmented reality. So uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks.